The purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. It is no substitute for professional care by your doctor or your qualified health care professional. Never disregard or delay professional medical advice because of something you've heard on this podcast or in any linked material. Guests who speak on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. Dr. Shirley neither endorses nor opposes any particular opinion discussed on this podcast. The views expressed on this podcast have no relation to those of any academic, hospital, practice, institution, or other entity with which Dr. Shirley may be affiliated. Welcome to Forever Fab, the podcast on fashion, the art of living, and all things beauty. This podcast is curated by Dr. Shirley Medea, MD, as the definitive source of holistic wellness through beauty. Welcome to Forever Fab, the podcast dedicated to fashion, the art of living well, and all things beauty. I'm your host, Dr. Shirley Madair, the founder of the Holistic Plastic Surgery Philosophy and your purveyor of this definitive source of living a beautiful life. In this podcast, I like to have intelligent and fun discussions around some of the things that I love and some of the things that move me with joy, namely fashion, art, wellness, and the many faces of beauty. I engage in conversations that I believe inspire, motivate, educate, empower, and help to make the world a more beautiful place, even if it's just by a few words. I keep it refreshing and real, educational and entertaining, scientific, and of course, fabulous. This week's episode is dedicated to using your gifts in the service of others. The title of the episode is The Sweet Smell of Success, Using Your Gifts in the Service of Others to Help Make the World a Beautiful Place. This is my interview with Sue Phillips. Sue Phillips was hired for her marketing expertise at Elizabeth Arden and also at Lancome. Subsequently, Tiffany and company recruited her as VP of Marketing Fragrance, where she spearheaded the development and creation and launch of the internationally successful Tiffany perfume for their 150th anniversary. Wow, that's major. From Tiffany, Sue established her own company, Centerprises Incorporated. I love that name, Centerprises. And she designed and launched fragrances for a number of worldwide brands, including Burberry, Don, Diane von Furstenberg, and many, many others, as well as well-known celebrities, including Zendaya, Jamie Foxx, Katie Holmes, Susan Sarandon, Lawrence Fishburne, and so many more. Perhaps more notably, if I may add, Sue uses her gifts and talents in the service of others, namely long-haul COVID patients who suffer from anosmia or the loss of smell. She joins me via StreamYard today to discuss using her gifts and her talents to help make the world a more beautiful and better place. Welcome, Sue. This interview comes at the perfect time. Congratulations on all of your success, and thank you for becoming a beautiful and fabulous member of the Forever Fab community. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Shirley. I'm so thrilled to be here. So lovely to see you, and thank you for having me. Thank you. So, Sue, when did you know you had a nose for fragrance? I don't think I ever sort of intellectually said that this is the time when I, I think I always loved fragrance. You know, when I was a little girl, my mom would go out and I'm sure we've all had the same similar stories. Mommy would go out, her beautiful perfume would stay in the air. And I felt very comforted. I remember feeling very comforted, even though she'd gone out with my dad. I was home with my brother, but I didn't feel that, you know, we were left alone. We were home but I felt that in my bedroom her fragrance lingered in the air so I know that for sure that was a a very important part a pivotal moment was when I was 12 years old and I got a holiday job because my mom was an amazing artist and she went to one of the big stores like a Bloomingdale's type and she was the interior uh, designer and so I got a holiday job in the fragrance department And I'll never forget one day I was reaching for a bottle of fragrance in the counter 
and it dropped to the floor. And I was mortified. This was more money than, you know, you had for a bottle of perfume. It's about 125 rand, which was a lot of money in those days. And I went to the department manager. I said, I'm so sorry. I dropped the perfume. Well, at the end of the day, they had had more sales because the fragrance diffused in the air. And so I became a heroine of, you know, fragrance. So I think that was another more important moment. And then uh, when I was hired by Elizabeth Arden to become the national training director for fragrance, which was very uh, serendipitous because I'd never really thought about being in the cosmetic industry, but because of my theatrical career, I could stand in front of people and speak and they thought I'd be great in training. So those were the three sort of moments that defined my fragrance career. That is amazing. Talk about serendipity to a certain extent, because it also sounds as if despite the serendipity or the seren yeah, despite serendipity, it sounds as if things were meant to be for you. I always believe in that, you know, you, you have a pathway and you have an idea and you have a trajectory of where you feel your career is going to go. And then suddenly something happens and you have to sort of navigate for to a different way. And, and I just take things the way they are. I mean, I'm not haphazard, but I do think that if things present themselves, then it's a sign that you should just move forward in that direction and see what happens. I love that. So you are quite intentional, even though you can be very open and fluid with what is presented to you, you are very intentional about your, your path or your next step. I think that certainly always from the time I was 10 years old and I was in my first theatrical play in South Africa, uh, communicating to me is very important. So whether it's standing up in front of people and speaking or training or, you know, performing or speaking on on Zoom or on Clubhouse or to people on StreamYard, for me, communication is key. And I love, love to communicate. Whatever it is, I'm communicating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we are so happy. I am absolutely grateful that you are here on this podcast, communicating with me and the listeners about your, your wonderful journey. Let's let's talk a little bit more about your journey. So, born in South Africa, I presume. I detect a little bit of an accent. <laughs> yes, sadly, I think I've lost a lot of it, but I do try and keep it uh, just willy nilly because that's how I speak. And even though people say to me sometimes, "What did you say?" and when I say "plant," and they can't understand the word "plant" because I put a a plant on a in a plane one day and I was going from one city to another and I wanted to take this beautiful plant to my mother and a big Texan came by and he was about to put his hand, his briefcase. I said, excuse me, sir, I have a plant up there. He said, a what? I said, a plant. He said, a what? I said, a plant. <laughs> so he understood. So sometimes I have to assume yeah. an American, you know, plant, vitamin instead of vitamin, migraine instead of migraine, but it all works yeah. out. It all works out. We all understand. Thank you. So you're you're a child you in, in South Africa, you're 10 years old, you're 12 years old, you have these pivotal moments with fragrance. What happens in your teen years and beyond that ultimately lands you in the United States working at the, these amazing behemoth legendary beauty companies? Well, I always wanted to be in theater. And so I auditioned for RADA, Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. And I went to London, guns blazing, feeling so motivated that I was going to be the next, you know, uh, Joan Crawford or whomever, <laughs> or, you know, uh, Janet Sussman. And guess what? Um, they had had a sort of a quota of South Africans in the in the in, in the uh, situation, and so. But I came to visit my brother, who was living in New York, and that for me was an amazing. It was at the time of uh, 1976. It was the bicentennial year, and America was on fire. It was so exciting. It was so. You know, just the colors, the sounds, the excitement. It was the birthday celebration of 200 years. Yes. And I just felt that, you know, South Africa was going through very challenging times politically. I didn't really feel that I belonged there anymore. And I came to New York seven months later. I was living here. So it was an amazing opportunity for me to come here. And how I landed up in the country was I got my green card and I worked for an immigration attorney and he helped me get my green card because I could stand up in front of people and basically communicate. Excellent. And who gave you the proverbial go or the green light to enter into 
these beauty companies. How did you find your way into the beauty industry from theatrics? Well, the headhunter contact, contacted me and he said to me, you know, there's a position in training. And I said, well, what's training? He said, you know, you train the people behind the counter. I said, wow, that sounds amazing. And he <laughs> said to me, and I had told him about my background, communicating in theater. And he said, Sue, were you any good? <laughs> and that question just prompted me to say, yes, I was fabulous. Yes. And that's how I got in. And I knew that if I equivocated and if I said, well, I'm not so sure, it wouldn't have given the positivity that they needed. So um, that's how I got in. And uh, so that was Elizabeth Arden, National Training Director. And it was interesting because I had to understand and learn about fragrance basically on the job. So I was uh, asked as part of my orientation to be in Macy's on Herald Square for yes. three months, becoming au fait with fragrance and customer relations and how to talk to customers and clients. And um, it was really a very inter interesting and probably one of the best foundations mm. to deal with the interaction between customer and associate. And then I traveled around the country. And one of the things that I'm very excited about and, and pleased to say that I grew up in a very sort of cultural society. My mother was beautifully, she had an art, she was an artist, she was a singer, she was a pianist, a musician. So I always had art and music in my life. And when I started my training seminars around the country, I always had music playing. I had beautiful flowers and artistic things in the room, in the training rooms, and beautiful fragrance in the air. So when people entered the training seminar, they were immediately oh. met with an experience. Yes. Now, I didn't even know what that sort of meant intellectually. I just came naturally to me. Mm. If I came to your home, invite them have music playing, have pretty fragrance in the air. And so when I left a market um, in various areas where, where I traveled, sales went sky high because the beauty associates were so pumped to go out and sell the fragrance. And at that time, it was Chloe for women and Lagerfeld oh. for men and Burberry for men and then women. And, uh, you know, they were so motivated and inspired and they had learned so much because of the information and the experience that I had sort of presented that they really wanted to get out there and go and sell the counter yeah. to their clients. So that's how it happened. Fabulous, fabulous. Now you clearly have a mind for business, but obviously a, a nose for fragrance. Um, what, what inspires you to help brands to innovate new scents? How do you help the brand create a fragrance? So the first one that I did was actually for Tiffany. So when I left Elizabeth Arden, I had already been in training and then they promoted me to product development for color, cosmetics and marketing. And then Lancome hired me as marketing director for fragrance and men's skincare. So when I finally, you know, got the position at Tiffany to be the vice president of Tiffany and the fragrance division, they had already started to work on that initiative for a while. And when they came to me and they said, Sue, you know, you've gone through the interviews, you've got the position. Uh, I was so excited. They handed me two submissions that they'd been working on. And I was so excited. I got the job before I was even out the building. I was in the elevator. I was already spraying. <laughs> and I was really disappointed because those submissions didn't seem to me to reflect the elegance and the, tif the quality of the Tiffany brand. And Again, I just felt that it was so important to communicate that. And uh, I got the job and I had to then resign from Lancome. And I called my future boss during that week and I said, you know, you gave me the submissions. I'll do whatever you want. But I don't believe that these are really important and quality driven for the fragrance for Tiffany. And we went down to the chairman and he said, well, we hired her, let her fix it. And so that's how it happened. So what do I do about creating fragrances for a brand or a person uh, or an environment mm. uh, and trying to really reflect the brand ethos 
and the attributes and the quality of a brand as opposed to reflecting my opinion and injecting my subjectivity. And to me, I've been able to really innately and then from a branding and marketing standpoint, understand what those attributes are for each and every brand so that, you know, when I create fragrances for individuals or brands or environments for hotels or spas or casinos, you have to really understand the absolute attribute of the brand. And, you know, let's say I love florals. Well, if the brand is not appropriate to have florals, then I shouldn't inject my subjectivity on that. So it's really important to be objective and to look at what the qualities and the attributes are for the actual brand itself. 100% completely sounds like a professional fragrance maker. <laughs> That's a lesson in and of itself, and I'm sure there, there's more to come. Would, what would you say? I know you were not, you were nonplussed with the three submissions you got for Tiffany. On the flip side, what scent would you say um, was the most exciting for you in your career, whether early career or recent? Well, I mean, ultimately, yes. You know, Tiffany, if you'd have told me growing up in South Africa that I would, you know, be vice president of marketing for Tiffany Fragrance, I'd say you're crazy. But yeah. that was very exciting. Yes. And then when I started my own company called Centerprises, um, becoming the general manager for Royal Brands, and we had the license for Burberry. Now, interestingly enough, when I was at Elizabeth Arden and I was the training director, one of the brands was Burberry, and that was a men's fragrance that we were able to Arden launched and distributed, and I was the training director and had to really explain and communicate to the beauty advisors what the Burberry heritage and history was. So fast forward now, I start my own business, and I become a consultant and general manager to this company called Royal Brands that had had the license. So now I know the heritage <laughs> and the history of Burberry because I'd already understood it from years before. Yes. And at that time, Burberry was still known as a very male-related mm -hmm. company. It was still the men's raincoat, the plaid, the scarf. Yes. yes. And, you know, when, when I was hired to do the fragrance, I said, well, you know, Arden really had that and the license had finally expired. And so uh, that we're, they were able to get the license for the new fragrance. And I said, I think we need to really explore the attributes of the Burberry brand that it was actually originally done for men and women. And it was a clothing company and royalty and the very wealthy and the very sort of um, elite were able to afford the Burberry clothing and the apparel. And so the positioning was to make it, even though it was for a very upscale audience, we still wanted to make it affordable. And I felt that it was important to position it for women this time because it was almost like an antithesis. Burberry is such a male-dominated raincoat yes. company. How can you transition that to become a beautiful feminine brand? Uh, and we looked at the attributes, which was a quality company, with you know clothing apparel and at that time they were actually creating apparel for women so it wasn't out of the blue it wasn't as though it was a disconnect they were selling apparel for women so we positioned it as a fragrance for women and called it society by Burberry. Wow. legendary legendary and and actually it's so appropriate and you were quite the visionary because we all know that nowadays the fluidity of being able to wear whatever you want, whether it's marketed for men, women, whatever, is really empowering. So that's quite that that was quite a vision that you had that you helped them to brand. And it's interesting that you say that because I, I don't know what other questions you have, but I will just say that now, you know, everything is about empowering and becoming a brand and how you look. You know, we're all on social media, we're on StreamYard, we're on Zoom, we're on uh, interest, Facebook Live, you know, how we look and how we sound and how we really present ourselves. Everybody has the opportunity to have and be their own brand. And part of that is actually reflecting your brand essence with a fragrance that reflects who you are, whether it's your man or a woman. You can wear perfume. You don't have to just wear cologne if you're a man. You can actually wear perfume. So, you know, 
custom branding and personalized branding has become such a thing now that everybody can reflect who they are through the power of perfume. Well stated, Sue, and I assure you when I'm ready to have my own fragrance, <laughs> I am calling you. <laughs> was it very, was it challenging for you to enter into the business of fragrance and whether it was or was not, did you have mentors in your career? You know, it was challenging, but I've had so many changes in my life, you know, just leaving South Africa, coming to a new country, leaving, yeah. you know, the, the corporate world, starting my own business, um, being, a, having, being a mother of, you know, I wasn't in my 20s when I was, you know, had my first child. So I've always kind of taken challenges and really gone with it. And I'll never forget, there was a gentleman, you asked me if there was a mentor. So when I first started uh, the fragrance business at Elizabeth Arden, there was a wonderful man, and I will never forget it. He was larger than life. He was about six foot four, and as tall as he was, he was wide. <laughs> <Wonderful. Proportioned. laughs> he was this wonderful guy who was a marketing guru and a PR branding guru, and he brought to Elizabeth Arden many of the brand opportunities, for instance, L Chloe and Lagerfeld and Burberry. And when I became the training director, I had to obviously be trained and get an orientation into fragrance. And his name was Jim Morton, and may he rest his, in his soul in peace. He, he passed away many years ago. And he said to me, Sue, I want you to become a fragrance expert. I said, how is that possible? He said, no. He said, you need to learn as much as you can and become a fragrance expert. I said, well, okay, sounds weird, but okay, whatever you say, Jim. And I have to say that he gave me the impetus to really think about fragrance in a different way and to explore the beautiful attributes and the, the nuances and the ingredients and the, you know, how fragrance makes one feel and the power of fragrance and how fragrance really can be connected to memory and emotions. And it's our most powerful sense. So you know, I think about that and I always say a little thank you to Jim for giving me the the impetus to become a fragrance expert. I would never have even thought about that. <laughs> You've just listened to part one of Forever Fab podcast. Please stay tuned for part two coming up next.